Bibles, and I'm assuming you do, open up to Ephesians chapter 6. Now, we, uh, I started a series a while back, and next week we'll continue with that series. Um, but today I wanted to talk about a, a different topic. Father, we thank you for the sufficiency of your word. We thank you, Father, for the gifting of your Holy Spirit, that we might be taught, that we might be led, that, Father, we even might be reproved. I ask that you would open your word to us today, Father. May the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So, when I was, oh, I don't know, eight, my oldest brother uh, messed up his ankle playing basketball, which is another reason I don't play basketball, because, you know, I'm not any good at it, and I don't want to get hurt. Um, so he was on crutches for several weeks, and then as he improved, um, he didn't need the crutches anymore. So my dad told me, uh, take the crutches downstairs, put them in the closet. And uh, I'm assuming everybody has a crutch closet, right? Um, so I got to the top of the stairs, and I'm looking, and I'm thinking, how does he get down the stairs with this? But there is a particular way you have to go downstairs with crutches. And it's not what I did. Because my brother, being quite a bit taller than me, I could barely get my arms up over. And you know you have to put the crutches down the step first. Because if you try and put your feet down, all the way down the stairs I went. And I looked back up to see my father staring down at me going, <laughs> and my dad did that a lot. Um, sometimes I think about some of the stupid stuff we did as kids, and I'm, I'm amazed that any of us are here. Now, I didn't tell you that story just to get a laugh. Um, what, was, what was the problem? What, what was my issue? I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't know how the crutches worked. Um, you know, obviously. I learned a life lesson in this, but I didn't understand how it worked, okay? And rather than asking someone that knew how they work, I just figured I'd do it on my own, and it left me in a pile down at the bottom of the stairs. Um, <clears throat> Ephesians 6, chapter, or chapter 6, verse 10. I'm just going to read this section. Paul says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. All right, I'm going to pause there for just a minute. Um, every moment of every day in your life, you are in battle. You, you are in a war every moment of the day because there are two forces contending for your eternity. There are no bench warmers. The audience is those who have come before us. <clears throat> you don't have a choice as to whether or not you are going to be in the battle. <coughs> Excuse me. But you have a choice <clears throat> on which side of the battle you will participate. Now it's important that we remember there is no 
neutrality. Okay? You read uh, John 3, we see that uh, God sent his son because he loved the world, he loved the population of the world, that we might be saved. Now, if you read a little bit further, um, John records Jesus as saying, uh, he did not come into the world to judge the world because the world was already judged. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I don't know what, what God's plan is for the, the Bushmen in Africa or the ones in South America that we have not yet found or, or are very difficult to get to. I don't, I don't pretend to know any of the answers for that. But I know that there is no neutral party in this. Um, now, we know who our enemy is. Uh, actually, there's a, a, a trifecta of, of evil in this world that is opposing our Heavenly Father and His plans. And uh, the, the, the leader of this is the devil, Satan, the deceiver and the accuser, and all the forces at his command, um, which uh, apparently is a, a large number. Um, and the devil is going to do everything he can to ruin your walk with God. You look at the parable of the, the sower of the seeds. Um, he scattered some on the road and the birds came and ate them immediately. Um, he threw some in the rocks and as they grew up they had no root and so they withered and died. Uh, he also scattered some in the weeds and they grew up and yet the cares of this life and, and the desire of wealth, the weeds strangled them out. Okay. And the last one, the only one that was uh, propagating itself is that which sold, uh, sowed in good soil. Okay. Now we look at that, the very first one we say, yeah, this is the devil came in and stole the seed. But uh, the, the devil has a lot more uh, than just stealing the seed. If you think back to Jesus uh, in the wilderness, the devil came to tempt him. The devil knew the scriptures. Okay? The phrase, you know, the devil quotes scriptures for his own ends. And if uh, Jesus had not been who he was, if he had not been the living word, uh, the devil put up a pretty good argument. Unfortunately for the devil, Jesus knew a lot more. Um, in this battle, we have no strength of our own. Okay? I, I, I don't know about you guys, but uh, without Christ, I wouldn't want to face the devil. Not on my own strength. Okay? Um, the second part of this trifecta is the world. Uh, scripture records that Satan is the prince of the power of the air in this world. Okay, um, You don't have to look very far at all to see that the world is at enmity with God. As a matter of fact, before we are saved, we are called the enemies of God. Okay? Um, the culture that we grow up in the, the things that we find acceptable uh, that Scripture does not, um, we, we kind of poo-poo them and, and uh, brush those off and, and move on. Um, but just like the seed that was sown, um, it may grow, but not to maturity. Okay? Um, just look around, folks, and you'll see how the, the, the world is turning more and more against Christians. Um, we don't see it over much here, and unless you're looking, you won't hear much about it elsewhere. Uh, but uh, just some months ago, uh, Mexico moved up to the uh, one of the top three most uh, countries that persecute Christians. Third, okay? And that was behind uh, North Korea, and actually I think it was India was the second one. Um, Scripture also says that the devil masquerades as an angel of light. Okay. 
we are called to be on our guide, on, on our uh, awareness, that he will come at us in several different ways. We have to be wary. Because when he comes as an angel of light, uh, it's just like in the garden. Now, I don't know, you know what the deal is with snakes with legs, and I, I don't know why Adam and Eve just didn't scream and run, because um, that's what I would have done. Um, but he deceived Eve by telling her more of what she wanted to hear. Okay. And when she took the fruit, and, and she saw that it was good for learning and, and having uh, wisdom, she ate. And then Adam, who scripture says was right there with her, she said, oh, here, have some. And he ate as well. Okay. Um, from that point on, uh, we see that the devil comes often in the guise of an angel of light, something that presents itself as good, uh, something that promises more. Okay. But he also comes against us as a roaring lion. Okay. He, he comes against us as something that um, I've never heard a lion roar, but I have heard a Malamute whine. <laughs> and that's not very intimidating. But, but think about this for a moment. <clears throat> if he's coming at you as a roaring lion, that's the obvious confrontation because he thinks he's got you. Okay? And he knows all those little tender spots in your life. He knows those things that are going to trip you up. He knows the things that trip me up. That's why he keeps throwing them in front of me. Okay? He is the, the ruler of the earth insofar as it's round but he has already been defeated, so he's doing everything he can to keep us apart from God. And he works <clears throat> very much through culture, and not just our culture. Not just our culture, he works in every culture. You know, I've not met a culture yet that somebody didn't, didn't uh, have greed or envy or lustful thoughts or a desire to take something that was not theirs. Every culture suffers from the curse of sin. All right? Um, <clears throat> if you've seen the movie God's Not Dead, <clears throat> the original one, um, two of the characters, a brother and a sister, in very different places in their lives, uh, their mother was suffering from dementia or, or Alzheimer's. I don't remember which they said, but she, uh, she didn't recognize them very much. And the son, who was living life up, and man, he had everything that you would think would make a person happy. Uh, he had girls, he had money, he had cars, he had houses, and, and his life was great. And so in the movie, you actually see him sitting with his mom, and he's questioning. He's saying, you know, look at me, I'm, I'm a success. And look at you. you, you can't even carry on a conversation. And she says something that I think is incredibly profound. Uh, because we don't face the devil in America very often as a roaring lion. But we do face him frequently as the angel of light. So his mom, who's just staring off into space, gives him an answer. And he says, she says, uh, Some people are content in their gilded cages with bars of gold. And they don't even realize that they're imprisoned. They're stuck fast. They cannot get out unless somebody would come and open the doors. And, and the, the idea in America, you know, we, we have, we, oh my gosh, we have so much stuff. And we're always looking to add to our stuff. When the kids were little, um, We had a rule that before birthdays or Christmas, we went through their closet and we got rid of toys that they no longer played with. And it was amazing how many times all of a sudden they wanted to play with that toy as soon as it was brought out. Um, but we, we had a rule that, uh, you know, if you're going to get gifts, um, you need to make room for them. Now, um, I look back at the, the, the toys that I had when I was little. 
and I look to what my kids had when they were little, and now I'm seeing what my grandkids are getting. Um, man, they got it made. You know, I had a Stretch Armstrong. <laughs> Does anybody know what a Stretch Armstrong is? Yeah, you remember that? I had one. <laughs> it was a sad day when his arm broke. <laughs> okay, so the culture is set against us, and we in America are most often entrapped by the cages of gold. You know, we come into our cages, we've got a, 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 a I was going to say something specifically, but I won't. We have a lot of comforts in there that, 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 that we enjoy. Uh, every once in a while, the cage might get shaken a little bit, but as soon as it stops, we put everything back in its place, and we are very content to stay in our gilded cage. So this is the second way that the enemy comes against us, the, the trifecta of evil. It's our culture. And, you know, if somebody were to make a move against us in America to require that we would lose, uh, give up our church, give up the Bible, give up any reference of fellowship or talking of Christ, how many of you would sit still for that? Hopefully none of us, right? Hopefully none of us. But when things are going well, it's so very easy to relax. It's so very easy to fall off your guard. It's so easy to get lazy in the faith. The third component, and this one is probably the most insidious of all, is ourselves. Okay. Who we were before we came to Christ that dude, he follows me around everywhere. I must have buried him at least twice. <laughs> Our earthly desires, those things that, that we desire apart from God, the enemy knows this. The enemy knows this. Hand me your phone. You guys know what this is. Oh, sorry. Um, should I show you? Should I show them? What? What I just saw. I don't know. Oh. Ta da! Aww. And when I turn it off, I can see lip marks. <laughs> These things are an incredible resource, but they come with a cost. And not just. <laughs> um, and it's not just the financial burden. It is a financial burden. But you become tethered to it. You, you get freaked out when it's not around, you know. Um, I, I, I have a horrible habit of leaving my phone different places, which is really weird for me, because like my keys and my wallet, they go in one of two places. They either go on the, the handrail, the, the half wall, or they go in my box. That's it, nowhere else. My phone I leave everywhere, everywhere. Um, you know, one time I left it in the refrigerator, but I needed another hand, so I set it down, put the stuff out, and then I closed the door. And it took me a while to find it, at least till the next meal. So, uh, I, I, I have a really bad habit of, of leaving my phone places, so if you call and it goes to voicemail, please leave a message so I know what's going on because chances are it's like under my bed or in the tailgate of my truck or somewhere. But we're tethered. It, it, it comes with a cost. It, it binds us to something. Like I said, it's an incredible resource. I love the fact that uh, within a matter of minutes I can pick up my phone and find that particular verse I was looking for. Okay. Um, it's a cost. So we are opposed by the devil. We are opposed by our culture, the world. We are also opposed by that condition which we had before we came to faith. The flesh. The flesh doesn't go down easy. You have to work and work and work to let the spirit overcome the flesh. 
Paul writes in uh, Galatians 5, he talks about this war that is going on. And then he lists uh, the behavior of who's winning. Okay? Now, understanding that when you come to faith, when you turn your life over to God, a, a mark is set. And in that mark, that moment that you believed, your eternity is safe. Okay? Now, I, I'm speaking of true salvation, not just, you know, we were at youth camp and everybody was crying and everybody gave their heart to the Lord and then went back outside to play volleyball. Okay? Um, we have ingrained patterns of behavior in our lives. Now, those places that we go to over and over and over again, we dig a rut to that place. It's very easy for us to get off the narrow way and, and get onto the, the highway and, and get back to those behaviors. I think this is why Paul tells us that, that uh, they are opposed to one another. So let's get back to the verse here. He says, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Very simply right there you, you, what does it not say it does not your strength it's God's strength you if you try this on your own it's going to get ugly it's going to get painful thank God that when he requires something of us he equips us for that so we are to be be uh, strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Now keep in mind what his might is. It's infinite. Okay? So when you see the giant, you see Goliath coming towards you, get your eyes off Goliath and put your eyes on God. Okay? David picked up how many stones? Five. 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 How many did he use? One. Okay? Why did he pick up the other four? I don't know. He thought they were pretty. I don't know. <laughs> but it only took one stone to make a difference. Okay. So in this, it's not my strength. It's God's strength. And then he says, put on the whole armor of God. Why? So you can stand. Sometimes the best we can do is to stand. Okay. Going on a little bit further. Uh, what do we stand against? The schemes of the devil. Uh, in another passage, it talks about the devil, and it says that uh, we are not unaware of his schemes. He is our immortal opposite, immortal enemy. What he desires uh, is for our eternity to be the same as his eternity. And he works very hard at doing this. Okay. Um, so we stand, we stand against the schemes of the devil, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Okay. Somebody translate that into simple English. People are not our issue. Exactly right. That person that's been after you, causing you problems, mm -hmm. causing you grief, causing you hurt, they're not the enemy. They are not the enemy. They're not the one. They might be the one that's being used, but they are not the enemy. Now, moving forward, um, we do not wrestle against ourselves, but against, and then it lists, and I don't know if this is a particular order, that these are lower and these are higher, or if, if Paul was just as it came to him, uh, but it says, um, we wrestle against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Now, I've heard it said that that's kind of a hierarchy uh, of our enemies. I, I don't know. I just know that there's a whole lot of them and they seem to be everywhere. Okay? So, verse 13, it says, therefore, okay, what's the rule about therefore? Why is it there for? What's it there for? Okay, so this part is contingent on the part that came first. Okay, the part that we just talked about is who is our enemy. 
And so we know who the enemy is. And then he says, therefore, because of this, take up the whole armor of God. that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Okay, So in that little little uh, verse there, we have a, an amazing number of things going on. Okay, We found out who our enemy is. We found out that, that we are not left um, without weapons of our own, without protection of our own, uh, and ultimately, um, we have to stand. We will not give ground. So, <clears throat> uh, that you may be able to, to uh, withstand an evil day. And having done all, everything you've attempted has come to nothing. Well, it's not come to nothing. It's just not time yet. Stand. I would encourage you, um, years ago, uh, we were talking at our, our house and uh, I think it was me, Christy, Mackenzie, and Thaddeus, and, and I think Josh was there. Um, we wrote a list of, of truths, foundational truths. Okay. Uh, number one is, is that uh, God is all-powerful. Number two is the devil is more powerful than I am, but not more powerful than God. So, so those two laid out side by side should help us to have a good understanding of where we are. Any successes we have are because God gave them to us. Okay? Right. So uh, I would encourage you to make out a simple list of biblical truths that you can go back to to be encouraged. Um, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the, the readiness given by the gospel of peace in all circumstances. How many circumstances? Oh. Yeah, so are there, are there any circumstances where this would not be applicable? No, no. no. okay. Um, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flames, the flaming darts of the evil one. And take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, most people, when they read through this, they stop there. Okay? All right, I've got all my armor. Now, when is it appropriate to take off your armor? Mm -hmm. well, I think we just give them back to God when we get to heaven and he just puts them back in the, sto the stockpile. <laughs> because we will have our hope right there with us. Um... So, we stand fully armored. I would encourage you, if you have not studied that passage out, I would encourage you to study it out. Uh, take a look at uh, the guards' attire that were, were guarding Paul at this time. Those things that he would see and, and know and understand. And that he could write to anybody in the Roman Empire, and they would immediately know what he was talking about as well. Okay? So, um, I would encourage you to get into this figure out what each of these are, but I just want to touch on a, on a couple of things here. Um, yes, sir. There it is. That's the wrong shield. <laughs> that's okay. Um, I didn't come up. No, no, that's fine. Um, the, the actual shield that we are using, what Paul refers to, is actually about five feet tall and square, kind of bent, kind of like this, and they would put it in front of them, obviously, because, you know, hopefully the guys behind you aren't trying to shoot you. Or, and then you would have your right arm free. So your right arm would defend against the guy to your right. Your shield would help defend the guy to your left. Uh, and it, it's a big shield. Um, with all of this, in all, verse 16, in all circumstances, oh no, I'm sorry, yeah. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the e evil one. Um, I would encourage you to look at that. That's just not just a metaphor. That's actually 
one of the uh, weapons that was popular at that time. You'd take an arrow and, and <coughs> put it in some tar, and then you'd light it and you'd shoot it. And when it penetrated, uh, that person was as good as dead because now they've got a hole where the fire and the tar is getting into their systems and it's not good. Um, take up the helmet of salvation. This, I think, is the, the simple truths that I told you to write out. Keep them up here. Know them in here. When the enemy came against Jesus and he quoted scripture, what did Jesus do? He quoted scripture right back at him. Okay? The only way that Jesus could have done that, the only way we can do that, is to know what the scripture says. Okay? Um, protect your, your mind, your thinking. I've told you repeatedly, I tell myself repeatedly, that we are to control our thoughts. Okay? Those things of God we need to dwell on. Philippians chapter 4. Um, we, we think on these things. And those things that are, are, are not of that, we got it. We got it. No room. No room. Um, so we need to know our offense, offensive weapon is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And then uh, verse 18, he says something interesting because this is not uh, is the Word of God, period. It's is the Word of God, comma. Praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end, Keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And then Paul actually takes that down just one further step. He says, and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. So this armor has a purpose. It's not to dazzle people. It's to defend you. It is something that helps you in this war. Uh, you, you only have two options in this war. Okay? You are either going to be an enemy of God or a follower. But there's no other opportunities. There's no other sides. Okay? And, and you'll see a lot of people, especially in America today, that they're not really atheistic. They're agnostic. Okay? Without knowledge. They, they don't want to be bothered. Man, I got so much going on about that stuff. Do you believe in God? Um, could be. Uh, and, and what you'll find out is the agnostics, um, the, they're quite, quite honestly a little bit more difficult to deal with than the atheist. Okay? Atheist is, is no God. Okay? And, and actually, most people that are atheists, if they were honest with themselves, they wouldn't be atheists. They'd be anti-theists. Okay? They're opposed to anyone believe in God. Okay? So we, we take up the armor, we take part in the battle, and the, the really cool thing about this is um, Diane, come here. Cassie, you take it. People whose Bibles are falling apart have lives that are not. <laughs> Alright, side by side. We stand together. Okay? My shield will protect this side. My sword will be an offensive weapon here because her shield is where? Yeah, it has to be left hand. No, no right hand shields. Okay. And we defend each other. I push somebody back here and I see somebody coming after her. I can defend her. I can put my sword over. I can put my shield over. This is the body of Christ. Okay. I just like embarrassing people. <laughs> We have got to be united in our stand. Okay? We have got to be knit together in the body of Christ. We have to be willing. We have to be willing to hurt when people hurt. We have to be willing to rejoice when people have joy. Okay? We have got to be there for one another. Paul writes in, in 1 Corinthians that uh, you know, we are the body of Christ. Now, I, I don't know what part of the body of Christ you are. But for me, right now, I'm the dry mouth that shares the word. <laughs> for now, um, as we get into uh, what's my job, what's your job, 
we're actually going to kind of do some studies on where you are gifted and, and that might hopefully it'll open your eyes to see where you fit in the body of Christ. Okay? Because I, I absolutely believe that the gifts are for today. Um, I don't know that we necessarily use them the way that they were intended to be used then, but scripture is very clear, you know, that, that the gifts are for today. So here's what I want to say to you. We are at war. Whether you want to be or not is irrelevant. That's irrelevant. It doesn't matter. Okay? Now, you can choose which side to be on in this war. That is what God has gifted us with, to decide where we're going to stand and, and who we're going to stand with. Um, so many people believe, oh, no, you know, I'm just going to sit and watch. Yeah, the battle doesn't allow that. Okay, there's no stands for, for people that don't want to fight to sit in. The, the stands are filled with those who have come before that we might stand in our testimony. Okay, um, so as you are in war, what are you doing to help your side succeed? What, what, are, what are you doing? Your personal responsibilities. How are you working to better the people around you? How are you working to uh, help someone to defend against the enemy's frequent attacks? Okay. We have to first be aware. We have to know the enemy's out there. But we also have to be aware when a particular person is, is under attack. And I tell you right now, Jesus Community Church has been under attack for two months. I don't know why. I don't know what, what the enemy thought we were going to do, that he threw so many obstructions out before us. But I know this. We stand in the strength of the Lord. Mm -hmm. We do not give up the fight. We help and make sure that each of us is doing well. And when we find that somebody is struggling, first you have to be honest and let them know you're struggling. Okay. You, you just have to lay it out and say, hey, look, um, I'm struggling. I need help. Okay. Um, you have to be willing to share so that the body of Christ can come and minister to your needs. You have to be open about it. Okay? Um, and, and on our part, it may take a long time for that issue to be resolved. But we sang the song this morning, God is faithful. Right. Yeah. Faithful. Okay. Um, Paul says these light and momentary afflictions, and sometimes they don't feel light, mm -hmm. and sometimes they don't feel momentary, but there is a, a, a point in time where, where you will be past it. Okay. There's a point in time where God will uh, allow this season to be over to move you into a new season. Okay. So, um, understand you're in a battle, in a war. The battles will come all different places. Um, take up the full armor of God that you can stand. Be united with the body of Christ that you might be able to render aid where aid is needed. And you might receive aid when you need aid. Um, join with me as we pray. Mm -hmm. Father, our praises are not near enough. Our understanding is limited. Father, we cannot see around the bend. But you have said that you are faithful. You have said that in the midst of all of these ugly, horrible things, that we are to take heart because your Son has overcome the world. Help us, Father, to be steadfast, to be able to, to, to be able to detect the schemes of the enemy, to foil his plan. Father, that we would safeguard each other to encourage, to strength, to exhort. Father, that all of this might bring you glory. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.